I'm on a full-throttle, sugar-coated ride through a country that loves to bake. Come right in. I'm about to meet some of the greatest bakers on the planet. Cake Man, Brooklyn, USA, New Cake York. Man. A real place. Welcome to the United Cakes of America. Today, I'm in the state of Maryland to discover one of Baltimore's favorite cakes, the Pimlico cake. On an average week, I would make 40 of these cakes a week. Then I'll be down on the farm picking the fruit for one of the freshest peach cakes in the state. This is really, really good, I have to say. I'll also be adding my own twist to these American beauties with a decadent coffee and rum cake and a simple peach tartlet. And what I do love about this is the texture that you get from that marzipan. So I've made it to Maryland, one of the most densely populated states in the Union. And I'm starting in the largest city. So I'm heading to Baltimore, which used to be the capital city of America. Sitting on the Chesapeake Bay, the largest estuary on America's east coast, Baltimore has always been an important port, and it was the first taste of America for many arriving immigrants in the 19th century. Today, Baltimore's harbour still attracts people from all around the world. But drive only a few blocks from the water and you get a very different idea of life in this multicultural city. People think about America, they think about the American dream and they think it's all glitz and glamour and Hollywood and Beverly Hills. Fact of the matter is, this is what America's all about. Different cultures all brought together. You turn a corner, you've got a Greek village. You, you turn a corner, you've got an Italian quarter. This is true America, I guess. I'm heading to the west of the city and to one of Baltimore's most notorious suburbs, Pimlico. Not to be confused with the elegant area of London it's named after. With a flash car and a large camera, you do seem to attract a lot of attention. We've got a lot of people looking at us. A lot of people. You can tell from their eyes we shouldn't be here. <laughs> Pimlico's most famous landmark is its race course, and right next door to the ground, Racegoers would often frequent one of Baltimore's most glamorous restaurants, the Pimlico Hotel. The restaurant closed in the early 90s, but for over 60 years, it was the home to the city's favorite cake. I'm heading to the track to meet up with Rita Davis, the one-time owner of the Pimlico. Rita, great to see you. So nice to meet you. Now, I've heard a lot about this hotel. Lots happened there, yeah. and it's probably talked about as much today as it was then. The food was incredible. Is that is that you think that that was the defining fact of why it was successful? The food or what, I thought what? it was the food and the family. It was a family-run business. Because you can see when talking to you, there's an element of Love. glint in your eye, but there sadness is. that it's not here. Absolutely. You still get that now. Absolutely. I miss the people. I don't miss the job. We were all in it together. So you brought some menus. And big menus. I always think there were always back then big, there were menus. big menus. Big you know? menus. My my family believed in big menus. Yeah. <laughs> Can you imagine shrimp two dollars and fifty cents? <laughs> so <laughs> when you were busy. Oh, yeah. it was. Something many of the diners would have been looking for was the arrival of the dessert trolley and the locally renowned Pimlico cake. Many years ago, we had a pastry chef who made a wonderful cake which was seven layers and it had this magnificent French custard and this wonderful chocolate icing. Yeah. People just called it the Pimlico cake. And we didn't patent it, unfortunately, right. <laughs> because you could go in many restaurants now here in Baltimore and you'll see on their menu the Pimlico cake. But it all started at your it place. It all started at our restaurant. And do you still cook it now or is it something that... I don't, because uh, we're not being in business anymore, but where we're going, 
I think they probably do the very best job. I'm driving with Rita to the Pimlico Cakes new home and as we leave the race course she shows me where the restaurant used to be. Oh my a god. A storage building. A storage building. But it was right here. We're going to make a right. We were right here on this corner. Oh my god, look at this. I could not drive down here, I bet, for five years without crime. And this was all the property here. And yeah. we had a parking lot right here. <laughs> and none of this was here. The hotel might not be there, but its legacy still lives on in its cake. Hi, guys. Rita has arranged for two classic Pimlico cakes to be prepared using the hotel's original recipe. And there's far too much cake for two, so we're joined by Rita's sister, daughter, and Debbie and Eddie, who both worked in the kitchen at the Pimlico. So, Eddie, th this is the traditional one, yeah? Correct. Go on, I'll leave you to dive in and cut it. Less, less. Look at the size of it. And at these, these probably actually were a little small right. for the slices. I mean, everything, everything from the bakery at the Pimlico was yeah. gigantic. I, I Whether it was an eclair, no matter what it was, it right. was big. Not only big, these cakes were popular too. On an average week, I would make 40 of these cakes a week. This size? Yes. When I would try to make something fancier or change some of the dessert menus, right. that could never come off the menu. How popular is it in Baltimore, this cake? Uh, is it easy the, to find? The, yes, it's very easy, but it's not as good as this one. People have their own rendition of it, which is very different. Probably the half a dozen places where you can find it on the menu all the time, those restaurants have a direct connection to working at the Pimlico. But I often think it's like a lot of dishes anywhere, wherever you travel the world. I think the true classics like that should always stay like that. You shouldn't mess around with right, them. But, right. it, but it's like telling a secret in the circle. It, it, it so has tell me changed. the recipe then. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. <laughs> Now, inspired by the Pimlico Hotel, which is sadly no longer around, I thought I'd do a dish which was inspired me when I was training when I was a young kid. I used to be a pastry chef of a very famous hotel, and we used to do a dish similar to this. It's a coffee and rum cake. Start by creaming together some soft butter and sugar. Now, you can tell when it's ready, when it almost just changes colour from the buttery yellow colour to a white sort of colour. Mix in some coffee essence, a pinch of salt, and then six eggs. The secret is not to allow the mixture to split, so that's the reason why we add the eggs one at a time. When the batter is smooth, grab the flour. The main thing is, is when the flour is added, you keep, treat it really carefully, and always mix this bit by hand. Because when you ever add flour to anything and mix it, it toughens up the gluten, the protein in the flour, which causes your cake to almost shrink. This is the ideal consistency that we want. It's called dropping consistency. It just falls off a spoon. Just before it goes in the oven, just drop the cake mix. You can see now it's filled in the gaps all the way around the edge. Pop it in the oven, 350 degrees Fahrenheit, for about 20 minutes. While the cakes bake, make a quick meringue. Bring some sugar to the boil and whisk your egg whites. This is 120 degrees centigrade now. And pour it on to the egg whites. What you don't want to do is pour the sugar in too quickly. You want it all to more or less cook evenly. The egg whites will cook by the time the mixture has cooled. Then your meringue is ready. I'm going to use this as a little garnish to go with the cake. These cooked meringues will need to bake in a low oven for about an hour before I can assemble my forest floor inspired design. There you have it. All will be revealed in a minute. Most of the meringue is used for a wonderfully smooth fudge topping. Gently mix in melted chocolate and soft butter. So pop that in the fridge and we've just got to wait for the cake. Once the cakes have baked and cooled, you're ready to build. Start by cutting your layers. Best ways to get a nice, even slice through a cake is to continue turning. So the best way to do that is take a knife, 
cut almost a third of the way through and continue all the way around. Now what I want is two flat pieces out of each one of these cakes. And I'm not too bothered about the bottom bit. That's for the chef who made it. And then we can start to assemble it. So, and I've got some rum syrup here, which is basically just sugar syrup and rum mixed together. As a filling, I'm using a simple French creme patissiere, similar to the Pimlico cake. It's perfect for a hotel dessert trolley, as it holds much better than double cream. I'm gonna to top it with a fudge topping now. The easiest way to ice a cake with a fudge topping is to put plenty on to start off with, because you can always take it off afterwards. And to push it over the sides first, so it just falls over the edge, so you get the top nice and flat. Finish with an icing comb and chocolate shavings. You could stop there, but my garnish is ready. Now these meringues are nice and firm. If you want a sticky meringue in the center, then you use a little bit of white wine vinegar or corn flour added to the mix. A dusting of cocoa powder and icing sugar, and there you have it, a sweet mushroom. But in essence, this is just a simple little cake. The only complicated bit, I suppose, is the meringue. That's the bit that takes the time, but it's really that bit that makes it. And there you have it, my coffee and rum cake with a mushroom topping. This is a classic dessert trolley dish with a nod to the Pimlico Hotel in the creme patissiere filling. It's kind of weird that foods can bring back such memories. And you've only got to look at the Pimlico cake and Rita's enthusiasm for the cake and the hotel. And I suppose it's the same with this cake. This is 20 years ago since I last made this, but the taste is still the same. It tastes just as good. It's delicious. I'm back on the road, heading out of Baltimore and into the fantastic Maryland countryside. about sort of 15 minutes out of Baltimore and already I've seen literally chalk and cheese where it comes to different scenery. You've got the city part of Baltimore, which is really a, a sort of a working class sort of city. And then literally just around the corner, you're into this. It's like the Caribbean around here. I've ventured into this lush countryside in search of a mouth-watering cake that's all about fresh ingredients. They look forward to seasonal produce over here, like deep fried soft shell crabs. They've got amazing sweet corn here. And in particular, one dessert, and that's the peach cake. But I always think that peaches is kind of like the ultimate comfort food. It's one of, the, one of the things that, when you weren't very well as a kid, and granny was looking after you, it would be tin peaches and ice cream that would make you better. I'm on my way to meet Steve Webber, a Maryland farmer with a real passion for peaches. Peach trees. Steve, trying it already. <laughs> Good to see you. Good morning. Good to see you. So this is the peach crop then? Well, we grow 40 varieties of peaches. Yeah. We start as early as the end of June and we pick through the end of September. So these peaches, be these are white peaches. Is there any particular way that you pick peaches off a tree? You can't pick a ripe peach without leaving marks on it. Right. So we like to pick it like a day ahead of that. And then you want it nice and round. Yeah. And you should have either white or yellow color here. How, how would you store them to make them last a little bit longer? Well, the refrigerator is good yeah. for a short period of time. Yeah. Apples you can keep for months in the proper storage. Peaches, you've got 10 days. That's it. And five's better. Right. We like to pick them get them into the market and uh, sell them the next day, the day after. Okay, can we have a look? Sure. So these you are the white... You see the juice? Yeah. <laughs> That's the sign. That's the if sign. If you don't get messy picking a peach, <laughs> not right. Right, can I have a taste? You certainly can. What are these called? Well, I mean, these are the this white This one's peaches. called Summer Pearl. Right. These peaches straight from the tree taste spectacular, and I can't wait to see how Steve uses them in his famous cake. So we're heading to the farm shop where most of his fresh peaches are sold. The US is the biggest peach producer in the world, supplying 25% of 
of the world's fresh peaches. But most of Steve's will end up in his own kitchen. Hi there, ladies. Hello. You all right? This is my wife, Joanne. Hi, Joanne. Hi, how Nice are to you? meet you. And Hannah and Mary, the, the best two peach peelers in the country. <laughs> is it traditionally that you that you peel them, or...? When you leave the skin on and lay the skin against the dough, it keeps it drier. Right. By making more slices and smaller cuts, and our peach cake's one of the moistest around. Right. Which is, may be why it's so popular. Please, do you blanch them, then, or...? So we blanch them for, like, what, 30 seconds? Mm -hmm. And you can see that the skin's just coming right off. See how she's doing that? It's yeah. just, just literally almost falling off the peach, and that's how you want it to be. But you want the peach to be not cooked at all. Joanne has made a simple sweet dough and allowed it to rise. She then places large slices of skin peaches evenly onto the dough. So out of all the things that you produce on the farm, would you say that the peaches are your favourite? Oh, yes. Yeah? I, I definitely love peaches. Steve has a piece of peach cake every morning for breakfast. <laughs> he says he has to sample it to make sure it tastes good. All right. <laughs> Once the peaches are in place, the fruit is given a light dusting of cinnamon sugar and then the cake goes into the oven. No glaze, no fuss, just fresh fruit on dough. 45 minutes later and this peach cake is ready. For the final flourish, Joanne adds some powdered sugar. This cake is made for just six weeks out of the whole year, but in that small window, Steve and Joanne will sell over 8,000 of them. And it's not long before I find out why. This is really, really good, I have to say. I don't know how you make that dough, but it is delicious. Oh, the, it's not the, too the sweet. Dough, the dough's incredible. Yeah. But there's just a tremendous peach flavour on there on top of it. This really is the ultimate fresh food, because these peaches were picked this morning. You cook it that day. What I loved about that peach cake was its simplicity. It's just fresh peaches and a really simple dough. And I'm going to take the idea of that and use some great quality peaches, some marzipan and puff pastry. Now, first of all, for our peaches, what you need to do is peel them. Now, Steve and Joanne's idea of peeling peaches would be to blanch them. The problem is with that, unless you get fresh peaches like theirs are, it can drop to bits. So the best way to do it is using a blowtorch. A gas hob will work just as well. Once the peach is black, remove the skin with a clean tea towel. Now, the most important thing with this is the peach stays nice and firm. After a quick rinse, carefully cut the peach in half and then just twist. Now, also as a base for this, we're going to use two ingredients that are fresh out of the fridge, ready-made puff pastry and marzipan. On a floured surface, roll out the pastry nice and thin. Now, what I loved about that peach cake was its texture underneath. And particularly, they get that out of the really good quality peaches, but also the dough that's underneath it. It's kind of like an enriched yeast dough. But it does take a little while to make, but you can get similar sort of taste and effect using ready-made puff pastry. And the great thing about ready-made puff pastry nowadays is that it's made with proper butter. And because of that, you get really good flavour. Once the pastry is rolled out, cut out your base using the peach as a template. Just as you get to the top, take this bit and create a nice little leaf. Decorate the leaf, then prick the centre of the pastry to make sure it cooks through. Then slice your marzipan. This is just almonds, sugar and water. That's how you make marzipan. And you can buy this from any supermarket, really. But go for the one that's natural in colour. Don't go for the one that's like a, a fluorescent day glow orange colour. The marzipan lies on the pastry, then slice half the peach and place onto the pastry whilst keeping its shape. And then a little bit of egg wash. But the idea is just to keep it as simple as they did, really. When you've got ingredients as good as that, you don't really need to do anything else with it. A sprinkle of sugar and it's into a really hot oven. And while that's baking, what I'm going to do is still simplify it, but do a, a garnish that's traditional with peaches, and particular peach melba. Heat some sugar until it goes a nice, even golden brown colour, then add some orange juice. The basis of this is used for many sauces, the most classic of which is crepe Suzette. 
but this caramelization works really well with the peaches. To the caramel, add pistachios, almonds and raspberries. Delicious. With my peach pastry ready, I give it another quick blast of the blowtorch for some colour and then it's ready to plate. And what I do love about this is the texture that you get from that marzipan. You get this wonderful sort of soft texture and then the added benefit, of course, is this classic sort of garnish that you've got caramelised sugared almonds and the raspberries. And then for a nice added kick, just some vanilla ice cream. And there you have it, my take on a classic Baltimore peach cake. This is a simple dessert that really makes the most out of fresh peaches. It really is delicious. The peaches aren't as good though. I think Baltimore is like a lot of places, really. You don't have to go to and eat in a, a fantastic restaurant to find great food. You've got great food right on your doorstep, and, and particularly in Baltimore, it's a fascinating city and one that you'll never get to grips with in just a couple of days but it's certainly one that I'm going to come back to.